people who are not well read assume that a degree gives you authority. A degree is meaningless, especially in our time of academic inflation. I've become more and more a fan of defund academia. Today, there was an 18-year-old kid recently, Democracy Now! covered it, who dethroned a guy at Stanford who was publishing big papers for 30 years. This is in the realm of science itself, let alone the political realm of the humanities that has been destroyed by an ideology created by the CIA meant to divide, meant to destroy citizenship, meant to de de destroy humanities. They don't understand that that was the very soft power by which we people, normal people, buy into the democratic system. And now we see the results of this. The results of this with places like Mali and Burkina Faso and all these African countries are seeing themselves as overthrowing their colonial yoke, choosing their own dictators over the dictators of the West, choosing Putin over the dictators of the West. It's because of the moral bankruptcy of the Western ideals like democracy. Democracy is not a Western ideal. I don't know why, you know, we are focusing on that. Let's look at Gayatri Spivak, who says that aporia, aporia, this realm of hospitality, this realm by which we give ourselves unto the other, this idea Westerners took up. I may disagree with you, but I will fight to the death until you are able to say it. That has been replaced by it's too much unpaid emotional labor to listen to the trauma of the people I disagree with. Today, emotions are commodified. Before we can commodify our emotions, before we can commodify the world, before we can com commodify our land, water, air, before we commodify any of that, we have to commodify our emotions. Sorry, I didn't say that the best way. So first, we have to commodify our emotions, not just commodify it. That's not the problem. The problem is not prostitution politics itself. The problem is the justification normalization of prostitution politics within our everyday interpersonal relationships that is killing the idea of oneness of humanity and now we see that racism is rampant because supposedly some people who are less privileged this idea of don't all of these hive mind ideas of don't punch down only you're allowed to only punch up people on the down they're allowed to be racist they're allowed to be sexist no we all have a responsibility that's what equality was supposed to mean. Again, we see attacks on Hannah Arendt by feminists who are at war with themselves. On Twitter, people continually talking about recently some posts with 10,000 likes or whatever saying, oh, what's so great about Hannah Arendt? She didn't even call herself a philosopher. Same with Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein's anti-philosophy, philosophical perspective is used to actually attack philosophy. But no, that's actually part of philosophy. Okay, to be self-critical. The fact that Hannah Arendt didn't see herself as a philosopher. These unread people are everywhere and they have PhDs and they have positions of power like Carrie Burissa for 20 years giving out grant money. Unread people who are able to dehumanize the humanities. The very motivation by which we have not to be racist anymore. And now we see the ramifications of it coming out at every corner with the acronym and alphabet people at war with one another and taking down the rest of sociality with it, the rest of social solidarity with it. Who is on the front lines of the lack of social solidarity? Healthcare professionals, teachers, people who are actually, people who are in the profession of emotional labor are the first to actually pay the price. Look up my definition of collective evaluation paradox on Urban Dictionary. Look up that definition. Collective evaluate devaluation paradox. Why am I on Urban Dictionary? I don't give a shit about what's happening in academia today. Defund the whole thing. Let AI take over everything. I am indeed. Now, there's another movement. A, a positivist movement. I call it the new positivism. Saying that people like Baud Baudrillard or Adorno are too negative. I like the Gabriel Rockhill critiques of global theory industry. That makes much more sense to me than calling people too negative. We live in a time of microplastics, forever more chemicals. I call them forever more chemicals, not just forever chemicals, because they build on top of each other. Forever more chemicals. Microplastics in our blood, in the human ecosystem. Every clam you open up, there's a microplastic in there. Every single one. It's insane. 
We don't, we have no idea what the ramifications of this are. We have glyphosate. We have our drinking water is filled with chemicals. Not to mention all of the global climate uh, alarmism that I can start listing. We don't even have to talk about climate change if you are one of the people that don't believe it anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. We have, we have passed the apocalypse. That's why we live in a cyberpunk dystopia. And I'm not saying that you should lose hope. Uh, this is, uh, again, these idioms. I'm, a, I'm very conscious of using popular expressions and idioms in my language. Oh, we should don't lose hope. I don't care if you lose hope or not. We are healing. The healing is coming anyway. The healing is happening all around us. There's healing everywhere. People are healing. People are realizing. After the feminist wars, people are realizing that we should be taking responsibility for our fellow human beings rather than saying it's too much unpaid emotional labor to deal with them, to deal with people. We are seeing that resentment politics has come to the end of its horizon. And today, we are gonna be continuing our studies on psychology, on the destruction of psychology, of our social lives, the colonization of the Department of Philosophy from the conflict of the faculties, psychologization of our everyday lives, psychologization of everything. Everyone's a psychologist today. Everyone repeats the hive mind idioms of psychology today. Sure, in the positive sense, we are all more aware of our mental health and we should be more aware of our mental health. But what's the motivation? What should be the motivation? The motivation should be something like community. We don't need therapy culture. We need community. Check out my website, omdome.ca, O-H-M-D-O-M-E.ca. That work came out of 15 years of hard work, of reading, not caring about my careerism. I could have got my PhD years ago if I wanted to, if I repeated what they told me to do. I didn't want to go down that route. It doesn't matter. The whole thing, the whole thing is a sinking ship anyway. Academia is a sinking ship. Study for yourselves. Study for the sake of studying. All these ideas are dead now. They have been saying, oh, we need a academia that teaches people how to work. Both the left and the right, constantly, so much non-thinking, so much repeating, so much repeating idioms. It's so annoying. But today we're going to be reading The Myth of Mental Illness, the ultimate example of toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is the idea that being a devil's advocate of critiquing is not loving, even though that was Arendt's main line. To critique is to love. We have to take responsibility for our own people that we're colonizing ourselves. Decolonization starts in Europe. Instead, there's a whole us and them game now playing out because people are unwilling to listen to other people's traumas. We are unable to see each other as one. Israel is the same as feminism. A past historical trauma, a people of the past of historical trauma, become the new lawgivers, become the new oppressors. Same thing, a diagnosis as we've been talking about on this playlist, lives a life of its own, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We live in a society where everybody's calling out projection in everybody else. <laughs> everybody knows what projection means. We all already know what projection means, but still people call each other, oh, you're projecting, oh, you're projecting, ha ha ha. And they think they're educated. The arrogance, 50 years after the myth of mental illness by Thomas Sass, the guy who wrote the medicalization of everyday life. The same guy who's friends with Karl Kraus, the first critic of Freud, will be getting to it. Excuse me, I've been very busy with my everyday life, but this is my joy. This is what I want to be working on. Good intentions will always be pleaded for every assumption of authority. It is hardly too strong to say that the Constitution was made to guard the people against the danger of good intention. Look at what's happened in Portugal. Mental health policies, and this is something that Anna has been talking about, Anna, the Young Turks lady. My aim in this essay is to raise the question, is there such a thing as mental illness? And to argue that there is not. It was the ultimate toxic masculinity perspective. That was the opening line of my essay, The Myth of Mental Illness, published in 1960. The issue, the American, in the issue of the American Psychologist. The book of the same title appeared the following year. In the 50s, when I wrote The Myth of Mental Illness, the notion that it was the responsibility of the federal government to provide health care to the American people had not yet entered national consciousness. You see that health care is in quotes. Look at what they are doing to us. Everything, all the food that we are sold, carbs and sugar. When you go and get health care in our health care institutions, it's because of, you know, a lifetime of eating McDonald's and it's, it's happening to me too. I have no choice because I see... There's a coupon, there's something for sale, whatever it is. It's a tasty addiction. Our society runs on selling addiction, justified by the psychologists, whether it's the addiction of cigarettes, justified by psychologists, or the various other glyphosate, justified by people 
who are in positions of authority. These same people are justifying that stuff. They're justifying in the negative. They're saying it's not bad for us. It's not bad for us to drink copious amounts of fluoride. Look at the... I live in Canada. We're supposed to have the best water. There are advertisements on Twitter talking about how you should drink the tap water here. Sure, our health, our tap water is better than most of the world, but still, there's still chemicals and fluoride and all this extra stuff in there. But there's advertisements saying, drink Ontario water, the best water in the world. Sure, the best water in the world. These are the experts. So when people turn around, the right-wing people turn around, people who have privilege turn around and fight against the system, we have emergency clauses against them. Justin Trudeau, emergency clauses against people who are fighting against man mandatory COVID. Now we are seeing the ramifications of Pfizer and all of these, I dare I say, conspiracy theories about, about them. They didn't solve anything. Did they make society better? I, I certainly had brain fog for a very long time. Regardless, most persons called mental, pati mental patients were then considered chronic and incurable and were confined in state mental hospitals. The physicians who cared for them were employees of the state government. Physicians in the private sector treated voluntary patients and were paid by their clients or the clients families since that time the formally sharp distinctions between medical hospitals and mental hospitals voluntary and involuntary private and public psychiatry psychiatry have blurred into non-existence the personal is political that's the root cause of all of this stuff the personal and the political have to be separated they should have been separated but not any longer the political imposes itself on the on the personal at every turn, justified by a horde of undergrads who are not well read, including me. I was part of the horde, protesting people like Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson recently said, how did you stop the protest? He's like, I had my, I started having my uh, lectures at 8 a.m. Nobody would show up. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Virtually all medical and mental health care is now the responsibility of and is regulated by the federal government and its cost is paid in full or part by the federal government. Few, if any, psychiatrists make a living from fees collected directly from patients. This is not this is not a public versus private argument. I believe in public health care, okay? The issue is more complicated than that. The issue is that, and we're gonna see, look at what's happened in Portugal. These people with policy, right? 15 years ago, we were all saying, oh, Portugal, look, the, the drug rates are going down. People are using less drugs in Portugal. That should be a model for the world. Recently, the Portuguese Authorities came and said, no, actually, Portugal is not a model for the world. Look at what's happened in San Francisco. None is free to contract, and I'm going to cut this video with that. None is free to contract directly with his patients about the terms of the therapeutic contract governing their relationship. Everyone defined as a mental health professional is now legally responsible for preventing his patients from being dangerous to himself or others. In short, psychiatry is medicalized through and through. The opinion of official American psychology psychiatry embodied in the American Psychiatric Associ Association contains the imprimatur of the federal and state government. There is no legally valid non-medical approach to mental illness, just as there is no such approach to measles or melania, melanoma. This is why 50 years ago it made sense to assert that mental illness is not a disease, are not diseases, but it still makes sense to, to say so today. Debate about what counts as mental illness has been replaced by legislation over the medicalization and demedicalization of behavior. Please check out my defense of Agumbin video, very much on the same page as this man. I, I really wish, you know, I had some sort of social media clout at some point and I could get people like Agumbin and Thomas Saz. I mean, Thomas Saz is rest in peace now. I really want to get these minds to come together, hopefully some time if my channel becomes anything, which probably not because all of the difficult things I talk about it's definitely, <laughs> definitely throttled. And people who dislike what I say come and click. Like abuse, a growing definition of abuse, daily growing definition of abuse by people who have never studied trauma, have never deeply studied trauma. Old diseases such as homosexuality and hysteria disappear, while new diseases such as gambling and smoking appear, as if to replace them. 50 years ago, the question, what is mental illness? was of interest to the general public, as well as to philosophers, sociologists, and medical professionals. This is no longer the case. The question has been answered. Dismissed would be more accurate by the holders of political power. And I would add the social power. People who have social power and who are unwilling to say that they have social power. Representing the state, they decree that mental illness is a disease like any other. Political power 
and professional self-interest unite in turning a false belief into a lying fact. In 1999, Clinton declared mental illness can be <laughs> accurately diagnosed, successfully treated just as physical illness. Tipper Gore, Clinton's mental health advisor, stated one of the most widely believed and most damaging myths is that mental illness is not a physical disease. Nothing could be further from the church. truth. And you have a whole swath of militant people saying, you think that this is not a disease surgeon G surgeon general so this is what you need to have the population enslaved you need the best way to enslave a population is with other slaves surgeon general david Sh satcher agreed just as things go wrong with the heart and kidneys and liver so things go wrong with the brain white house fact sheet on myths and facts about mental illness asserted research in the last decade proves that mental illnesses are diagnosable disorders of the brain in 2007 biden then senator now vice president declared now president and it's about time that we start treating it as such we must lead by example and change the names of our federal research institutes to accurately reflect this reality by changing the way we talk about addiction oh, he's repeating the hive mind idioms we change the way people think about addiction both of which are critical steps in getting past the social stigma too often associated with a disease if you're repeating the same hive mind idioms as the ideology professed by the cia and also calling yourself decolonization you are i don't think you're very being very reflective at the same time biden introduced to the senate a bill titled the recognizing addiction as a disease act biden did that the legislation called for renaming the national institute on drug abuse as the national institute on disease addiction and the national institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism as the National Institute on Alcohol Disorders and Health. In 2008, Congress required insurance companies to provide people with mental illnesses the same access, access to affordable coverage as those with physical illnesses. The claim that mental illnesses are diagnosable disorders of the brain is not based on scientific research. It is a lie, an error, or a naive revival of the somatic premises of the long discredited humoral theory of disease. My claim that mental illnesses are fictitious illnesses is also not based on scientific research it rests on the materialist scientific definition of illness as a pathological alteration of cells tissues and organs if we accept the scientific definition of disease then it follows that mental illness is a metaphor and that asserting the view that view is asserting an analytic truth not subject to empirical falsification again thomas says is qualifying qualifies that's what you do we started by saying how these people look to Hannah Arendt and say that she him, herself calls herself not a philosopher when she is in fact the best philosopher, uh, one of the best philosophers of the last hundred years, even though she calls herself an anti-philosopher. Same with Wittgenstein. People are so dumb. Right? They don't understand what a qualification is. They don't understand. And these, this person has a PhD. You know, I'm, I'm ranting about it on my Twitter. I don't recommend going to my Twitter. It's just rants. <laughs> My great, unforgivable sin in the myth of mental illness was calling public attention to the linguistic pretensions of psychiatry and its preemptive rhetoric. That's what I'm talking about. Even with, even, see, the bumbling, the bumbling philosopher, the bumbling theory guy, he's always self-questioning. He's always self-reflective, but he's never in a position of authority, <laughs> right? The guy who's telling you not to eat sugar, like Dr. Eric on YouTube, which I highly recommend. He's the bumbling guy. He's always, you know, making qualifications about himself whereas the guy who gets all the chicks right he never he never makes any uh claims of self-reflection he never makes any claims of qualification qu claims you don't know what qualification is look up qualification and this the problem is this the school system is getting you know i've been working in education for 10 years almost and the school systems keep getting dumber and dumber and dumber as we have more affirmative action position the teachers are getting dumber teachers know all of these alternative ways of wasting students time i've been working in the private profession for a very long time i feel like my teaching skills have been honed because i've been working in the private profession i have to give good results otherwise the parents complain people are paying money now again i'm i'm a I'm trying, I'm a communist in a way. You know, I want, you know, to each according to their need, from each according to their ability in our society. But we have to have a society that can justify this. Right now we have, you know, to each according to the ability, blah, 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 at the same time as we're saying, it's too much unpaid emotional labor to educate you. It doesn't work together. That's called abuse. My great unforg- and then 
Then we have all of this uh, abstraction, all of these conflation of left and right done by both sides, both sides, left and right. They don't understand anything. Okay. That's why I really like Dr. Shiva. I love listening to Dr. Shiva. You guys should take a look at his work. My great unforgivable sin in the myth of mental illness was calling public attention to the linguistic pretensions of psychiatry and its preemptive rhetoric. Who can be against helping suffering patients or treating treatable diseases who can be against equality it's the same kind of hive mind shit the road to hell is paved with good intentions the doors of heaven are opened by devil's advocate who can be for ignoring sick people or worse refusing to give patients life-saving treatment life-saving treatment rejecting that jargon it's all jargon the whole legal system is based on jargon i insisted that mental health hospitals are like prisons not hospitals that involuntary mental hospitalization is a type of imprisonment not care not medical care, and that coercive psychiatrists function as judges and jailers, not healers. And I would say even worse, they function as drug peddlers. You should see in prison what psychiatrists do. You want something to make you feel better? You want something to make you feel better? They do that shit. They do that shit in the same way that I've seen on the streets of Portugal, people trying to sell drugs because I have long hair, <laughs> you know, and I'm a hippie and these guys target me. They don't realize, I want something to make you feel better. I suggest that we view and understand, quote, mental illness, quote, and psychiatric responses to them as matters of law and rhetoric, not matters of medicine or science. They are matters of law and rhetoric. We view, I suggested that we view and understand mental illnesses in a matter of law and rhetoric. It's all law and rhetoric. Sophisticated. What does sophisticated mean? What's the root word of sophisticated? When we say a lawyer or a rhetorician is using sophisticated language, they're using sophistry, sophist language. Lawyers are trained to be sophists. They don't want to reach the truth. They are sophistry. Sophistry is, our, is the main game of our society today. We live in a legalistic society. This is the sort of rhetorical presumption is, of course, not limited to mental health. On the contrary, it is the popular political stratagem. We are a legalistic Rhetoric, rhetoristic and sophistry society. Philosopher kings, we live in a sophistry king's world. Biden is the greatest sophist. Trump is the greatest sophist. For example, my late friend, the development economist P.T. Bohr, saw the same sort of deceptive rhetoric controlling the debate about foreign aid. We all know what foreign aid is. Call official wealth transfers aid promotes an unquestionable, unquestioning attitude. It disarms criticism, obscures realities, and prejudges results. Obscuring reality is exactly what all of academia is made to do. All of these kids are paying to be brainwashed. They're going into debt to be brainwashed. If it's allowed in the academic curriculum, we should be critical of it. Watch my video on Leo Strauss. Leo, it's called Leo Strauss has warned us that wokeism would destroy academia. There's a difference between intelligentsia, actual intelligent work, and the academia. Academia is everybody repeating the same stuff, same hive mind idioms. It's like how the Chinese system would run 100 years ago. Who can be against aid to the less fortunate? Although it is intuitively obvious that there is no such thing as a disease of the mind, the idea that mental illness is not a medical problem runs counter to public education. Quote, education. God, I love Thomas Sass. Psychiatric dogma defining psychiatric psychiatry as a branch of medicine and mental disease as brain disease and relentless medical political propaganda. Thus, when a person hears me say that there is no such thing as mental illness, he is likely to reply, but I know so-and-so who has diagnosed as mentally ill and, and turned out to have a brain tumor. In due time, with refinements in medical technology, psychiatrists will be able to show that all mental illnesses are bodily diseases. This contingency does not falsify my contention that mental illness is a metaphor. It verifies it. The physician who discovers that a particular person diagnosed as mentally ill suffers from a brain disease discovers that the patient was misdiagnosed. That patient did not have a mental illness. He had and has a physical illness. The physician's erroneous diagnosis is not proof that the term mental illness refers to a class of brain diseases. Again, we live in a society where our health care professions. Doctors have the highest rate of suicide. One of the highest rates of, rates of suicide. Why? Because they're intelligent. They realize that the whole of society is messed up. I'm presuming here. The whole of society is messed up. They're put into the front lines of the last resort. And what do they do? Instead of helping people, you know, 
exercise and eat proper nutrition and stuff, they hand out prescription. They put band-aids over, over a society, a McDonald's society that addicts us to sugar, glyphosate, and all the rest. In part, such processes of biological discoveries has characterized the history of medicine. One form of madness after another being identified as the manifestation of one or another somatic disease, such as Berberi, epilepsy, neurosyphilis. The result of such a discovery is that the illness ceases to be part or form of psychopathology and is classified and treated as neuropathology. If all the so-called conditions now, called so-called mental illnesses, proved to be brain diseases, there would be no need for the mental, the notion of mental illness and the term would become devoid of meaning. However, because the term refers to the judgments of some persons about bad behaviors of others, the opposite is what actually happens. The history of psychiatry is the history of an ever-expanding list of mental disorders. Ever-expanding definition of abuse by people who are ill. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to use the I'm going to use the word by people who are mentally ill, put to positions of affirmative action authority, publish or paper Publish or die, posting up papers, neoliberal publish or die culture, careerism culture, prostitution culture. Right? They're, they have to keep publishing papers. And what do they publish? They publish bullshit. And then they get into positions of power because of their affirmative action. Just look at Kerry Burrasaw. Search Kerry Burrasaw's on my, on my YouTube or search Kerry Burrasaw's still up. I'm sure they're still up. The so-called work that she did is still up, not taken down probably. The thesis I had put forth in the myth of mental illness was not a fresh insight much less a new discovery. It only seemed that way and seems that way even more today because we have replaced the old religious humanistic perspective on the tragic nature of life with a modern dehumanized pseudo-medical perspective of it. Say, go watch my video on All About Love, Bell Hooks All About Love. Love is meant to be tragic. Love is meant to be traumatic. But they, all of these hive mind people come and say, no, love is this, love is that. And then we all, they have these... Ugh, I mean, look at all the old stories from Troy on, you know, millions of stories, G G Romeo and Juliet, the whole archetypes, all these archetypes talking about love. And look at what we have now, the so-called secularization of everyday life and with it, the medicalization of the soul and the suffering of all kinds. He, he didn't quote secularization here. I would have loved if he, if he did. But it's not even secular. It's this new form of religiization. We call it scientism. It begins in late 16th century England. Macbeth is a harbinger. Overcome by guilt for her murderous deeds, Lady Macbeth so-called so, so goes mad. She feels agitated, is anxious, unable to eat, rest, or sleep. Her behavior disturbs Macbeth, who sends for a doctor to cure his wife. The doctor arrives quickly and recognizes the source of Lady Macbeth's problem. Doctor to gentlewoman. Go to, go to, you have known what you should not, gentlewoman. She has spoken what she should not. I am sure of that. The doctor tries to reject Macbeth's offer to medicalize his wife's disturbance. Doctor, this disease is beyond my practice. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infectious minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs be the divine than the physician, I think, but dare not speak. Mac Macbeth rejects this so-called diagnosis and demands that the doctor cure his wife. Shakespeare then, in the following doc dialogue, has the doctor pronounce his immortal wounds exactly the opposite of what psychiatrists and public and public are now taught to say and think. Macbeth, how does your patient doctor? Doctor, not so sick, my lord as she is troubled with thick face, thick coming fancies that keep her from rest. Macbeth, cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, pluck from the memory of a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of the perilous stuff which weigh upon her heart. Therein the patient, must minister to himself. Doctor, therein the patient must minister to himself. Shakespeare's insight that the mad person must minister to himself is at once profound and obvious. Found because witnessing suffering calls forth in us the impulse to help, to do something for us to the sufferer, 
Yet also obvious because understanding Lady Macbeth's suffering as a consequence of internal rhetoric, the, quote, voice, quote, of consciousness, imagination, quote, hallucination. The remedy must be internal rhetoric, self-conversation, -conversa internal ministry, self-reflection. Shakespeare's rhetorical understanding of mental illness is portrayed most clearly and most dramatically in Othello, in which the title character is driven mad by a combination of Iago's malicious words and his own destructive and self-destructive self conversation. Jealousy. Iago. Work on my medicine. Work. Thus credulous fools are caught. Othello shall go mad and his unbookish jealously must construe poor Cassio's smile, gesture, and light behavior quite in the wrong. By the end of the 19th century, the medical conquest of the soul is secure. Only writers are left to discern and denounce the tragic er error. Kierkegaard warns, In our time is the physician who exercises the cure of souls, and he knows what to do. Doctor, you must travel to a watering place, and then you must keep a riding, riding your horse, and then diversion, diversion, plenty of diversion. Patient, to relieve an anxious conscience? Doctor, bosh! Get up with that stuff. An anxious conscience? No such thing exists anymore. Today, <laughs> today, the role of the physician as curer of the soul is uncontested. There are no more bad people in the world. There are only mental ill people. The insanity defense annuls misbehavior. The sin of yielding to temptation and tragedy. Lady Macbeth is n human, not because she is like all of us, a fallen being. She is human because she is mentally ill patient who, like humans, is inherently healthy, good, unless mental illness makes her sick, ill behave. The current trend of critical opinion is towards an upward re-evaluation re of Lady Macbeth, who is said to be rehumanized by her insanity and her suicide. Everything I read, observed, and learned supported by my adolescent impression that the behaviors we call mental illness and to which we attach the hundreds of derogatory labels in our lexicon of lunacy are not mental diseases. It requires hard reading. It requires reading culture. And less and less we have reading culture. We have less and less reading culture, which is what I'm anxious about. They are the products of the medicalization of disturbing or disturbed behaviors, that is, of the observer's construction and definition of the behavior of the person he observes as medically disabled individuals needing medical treatment. This cultural transformation is driven mainly by the modern therapeutic ideology that has replaced the old theological worldview and the political and professional interests it sets in motion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this, I'm going to make it better by saying the overt theological view and the implicit theological view. Again, I'm going to say that this is still theology. What we still have is theology. This materialism, scientism, theology. You just have to understand it as theology. That, that's, that definitely helps my mental health. Quote. I should mention here one of my childhood experiences that influenced me strongly and played an important part of my writing of the, mental, the myth of mental illness. Growing up in Budapest in the 20s, I learned about the famous 19th century Hungarian obstetrician Ignaz Simmelweis and his tragic fate. His statue stood and still stands in a small park in front of the city's old general hospital, not far from the gymnasium I attended for eight years. Simmelweis discovered the cause of piled bed fever before the discovery of bacteria as causative agents of diseases. As he accurately but impolitely put it, the causes was the doctor's dirty hands. Simmelweis also developed a method for preventing the terrifying epidemics of perpetual per per pearl fever, endemic to mid-19th century hospital maternity wards, hand washing with chlorinated water. I was deeply moved by the story of Simmelweis's life, the rejection of his discovery and remedy by the medical profession, inconvenienced by it and his incarceration and death in the insane asylum. It taught me at an early age what being wrong, that being wrong can be dangerous, but being right when society regards the majority's falsehood as truth, 
could be fatal. And that's, I'm going to talk again about what Spivak talks about. The opposite of affirmative action is affirmative sabotage. Putting your life on the line for something that you believe in. These are the only people worth listening to in our society. People that go against the grain. This principle is especially relevant to the false truths that are a basic part of entire society's belief system and the support economically and existentially import common practices. In the past, fundamental false truths were religious in nature. Today, they are mainly medical in nature. The lessons of Simmelweis's faith served me well. Once I grasped the scientific concept of disease, it seemed to be self-evident that many persons categorized as mentally ill are not sick and depriving them of liberty and responsibility on the grounds of a non-existent disease is grave violation of human rights. In medical school, I began to understand clearly that my interpretation was correct, that mental illness is a myth, and that it is therefore foolish to look for the causes and cures of the imaginary ailments we call mental, Ill mental diseases. Diseases of the body have causes, such as infectious agents or nutritional deficiencies, and can often be prevented or cured by dealing with those causes. Persons said to have mental diseases, on the other hand, have reasons for their actions that must be understood. They cannot be treated or cured by drugs or other medical interventions, but may be helped to help themselves overcome the obstacles they face. The societal need to deny embarrassing truths, sometimes called the Semmelweis reflex, is described as the reflex like rejection of new knowledge because it contradicts entrenched norms, beliefs, paradigms. The automatic rejection of the obvious without thought inspection or experiment the deep sense of the invincible social power of false truths enabled me to conceal my ideas from representatives of received psychiatric wisdom until such time as i was no longer under their educational or economic control and to conduct myself in such a way that would minimize the chances of being cast in the role of an enemy of the people something i should have learned from Thomas Sass and Henri Ibsen. Unaware of the evidence and reasoning summarized above, interviewers unfailingly ask, how can a psychiatrist say there is no mental illness? What experiences did you have that led you to adopt such an unusual point of view? When and why did you change your mind about mental illness? I try to explain, unusually, without much success, that I did not have any unusual experiences, did not do any so-called research, did not discover anything, and did not replace belief in mental illness with disbelief in it. Instead, I expose a particular falsehood and its far-reaching economical, political, and social consequences, and showed that psychiatry rests on two profoundly immoral forensic practices, civil commitment and the insanity defense. Consistent with those conclusions, I rejected the mendacious rhetoric of diagnosis, disease, treatments, eschewed the massive, coercive, excusing apparatus of the institution called psychiatry, and limited my work to psychiatric relations with consenting adults, that is, confidential conversations conventionally called psychotherapy. The birth of modern scientific medicine is usually dated to the publication in 1858 of cellular pathology as based upon physiological and pathological history, histolo histology by the German pathologist Rudolf Virchow. Emmanuel Rubin and John Farber, auth authors of the textbook Pathology, state Rudolf Virchow often referred to as the father of modern pathology, proposed that the basis of all diseases as injury to the smallest living unit of the body, namely the cell. More than a century later, both clinical and experimental pathology remained rooted in Virchow's cellular pathology. The standard American pathology text, Robin's Basic Pathology, defines disease in terms of what pathologists do. Pathologists use a variety of molecular, microbiological, and immunological techniques to understand the biochemical, structural, and functional changes that occur in cells, tissues, and organs. To render 
diagnoses and guide therapy. Pathologists identify changes in the gross microscopic appearance, morphology of cells and tissues, and biochemical alterations in bodily fluids, such as blood and urine. The pathologist uses the term disease as a predicate of physical objects, cells, tissues, organs, and bodies. Textbooks of pathology describe disorders of the body, living or dead, not disorders of the mind or behavior. René Lereche, the founder of modern vascular surgery, aptly observed, if one wants to, to define disease, it must be dehumanized. In disease, when all is said and done, the least important thing is man. For the practice of pathology and for disease as a scientific concept, the person as potential sufferer is unimportant. For the practice of medicine as a human service, in contrast, the person as patient is supremely important. Why? Because the practice of Western medicine is informed by the ethical injunction. Primum non, sic non sicere. <laughs> and the rests on the premise that the patient is free to seek, accept, and reject or reject medical diagnosis and treatment. Psychiatric practice, in contrast, is informed by the premises that the mental patient may be dangerous to himself or others, and that it is m the moral and professional duty of the psychiatrist to protect the patient from himself and society from the patient. According to the pathological scientific criteria, disease is a mental phenomenon, the product of the body, in the same sense that urine is a product of the body. In contrast, Diagnosis is not a material phenomenon or bodily product. It is a product of a person, typically a physician, in the same sense that a work of art is the product of a person called an artist. Having a disease is not the same as occupying the patient's role. Not all sick people are patients, and not all patients are sick. Nevertheless, physicians, politicians, the press, and the public conflate and confuse the two categories. Given the demonstrated usefulness and conceptual stability of the pathological definition of disease, how do psychiatrists support their claim that the human conflicts and unwanted behaviors they call mental illnesses are diseases in the same material sense as bodily diseases? They do so by the self-contradictory claim that the mental diseases are brain diseases and by declaring the Vershoian model of disease to be passé, a patent error. The work of the late Ru Robert Kendall, professor of psychiatry at the University of Edinburgh and one of the most respected experts on psychiatric dis diagnosis in the world, is illustrative. Over two decades ago, he wrote, by the 1960s, the lesion concept of disease had been discredited beyond redemption. He did not say how this was done. 1991. Kaz's famous jive that schizophrenia does not exist would have been equally meaningless had it been made to regard in regard to tuberculosis or malaria. Organisms mycro, mycobacterium tuberculosis and plasmodium falciparum may reasonably be said to exist, but the diseases attributed to their propagation in the human body are concepts just like schizophrenia. Diagnoses of malaria and tuberculosis rest on the demonstration of pathogenic microbes in the patient's body fluids or tissues. Diagnosis of depression and schizophrenia rest on no similar objective evidence. Not only is the distinction between mental and physical illness ill-founded and incompatible with contemporary understanding of disease, it is also damaging to the long-term patient interests of the patients themselves by implying that illnesses so described are fundamentally different from all other types of ill health it helps to perpetuate the stigma associated with mental illnesses the stigma of mental illnesses rests largely on mental health laws aimed at controlling persons said to be mentally ill and dangerous to themselves or others wonderful politicians pandering to the public's ever-present fears and dangers all of this is motivated by insatiable insecurity find the psychiatrist's willingness to define deviance as disease and social control as treatment useful in their conquest to enlarge the scope and power of the therapeutic state biopolitics what agumban calls moreover the belief that so-called mental health problems stand in the same relation to 
brain diseases as say urinary problems and in the relation to kidney diseases is superficially attractive even plausible the argument goes like this the human body is a biological machine composed of parts called organs such as kidneys the lungs and the liver each organ has a natural function and when one fails one of these fails we have a disease. We have, if we define human problems as the symptom of brain diseases, and if we have the power to impose our definition on an entire society, then they are brain diseases. Even in the absence of any medically ascertainable evidence of brain diseases, we can then treat mental diseases as if they were brain diseases. However, a living human being, a person, is not merely a collection of organs, tissues, and cells. The pancreas may be said to have a natural function, but what is the natural function of a person? That is like asking, what is the meaning of life? What is the definition of a person? Which is the religious, philosophical, not medical scientific question. Individuals professing different religious faiths have kidneys so similar <laughs> that, one <might> be <laughs> that one may be transplanted into the body of another without altering his personal identity but their beliefs and habits differ so profoundly that they often find it difficult or impossible to live with one another. The publication of The Myth of Mental Illness has given rise to a vast literature of criticism and praise, albeit unequally. Both opponents and supporters of my views have helped to clarify my thesis and to change the terms in which we think speak, and write about mental illnesses and psychiatric intervention. In an earlier preface to Myth the Myth, I explicitly stated that the book is not a contribution to psychi psychi psychiatry. This is not a book on psychiatry. It's about psychiatry. Inquiring as it does into what people, but particularly psych psychiatrists and patients, have done with and to one another. Nevertheless, many critics misread the book and missed that it is an effort to recast mental illness and psychiatry from a medical into a linguistic rhetorical phenomenon. Not surprisingly, the most sympathetic appraisals of my work have come from non psychiatrists who felt threatened by my revisioning of psychi psychiatry and allied occupations. One of the most perceptive and well-read informed comments about my work, the essay, The Rhetorical Paradigm in Psychiatric History, Thomas Sass and the Myth, Myth of Mental Illness by Professor Richard E. Vatz, law professor of Lee Weinberg wrote, after publishing a number of articles critical of psychiatric concepts and practice in 61, Thomas Sass wrote his seminal, The Myth of Mental Illness, a book which challenged the medical identity of psychiatry. The historical role and potential consequences of Sass's revolutionary reconceptualization of the field of psychiatry can be characterized as a major paradigm change. I see what he's saying he's saying it's not really a major change it's what we've always been doing in Saz's new paradigm it's not a new paradigm which we call a rhetorical paradigm psychiatric psychiatry has no clear puzzle to solve Saz's re rhetorical paradigm implies that the deviant behaviors which constitute psychiatry's puzzle are at least potentially understandable if not sensible or commendable as game playing and symbolic actions strategically chosen as responses to varying social situations in his rhetorical attack on the medical paradigm of psychiatry, Sass was not only arguing for an alternative paradigm, but was explicitly saying that the psychiatry was a pseudoscience comparable to astrology. Vatz and Weinberg cogently noted that accommodation to rhetorical paradigm is quite unlikely in as much as the rhetorical paradigm represents so drastic a change, indeed a rep repudiation of psychiatry as scientific enterprise, that the vocabularies of the two paradigms are completely different and inca incompatible. Saz argues that to understand both behaviors called mental illnesses and the practice of psychotherapy, one must understand one must understand not medicine but rhetorical and met rhetoric and metaphor. This fo or philosophy, let's say. This focus on persuasive language in Saz's rhetorical paradigm has significant ethical implications for both psychiatrists and mental patients. In rhetorical theory, language inescapably is linked to responsibility, and Saz argues that the entire psychiatric enterprise hinges on the notion that human beings diagnosed as mentally ill have a brain disease that deprives them of free will. Saz's rhetorical paradigm, however, portrays these behaviors as freely chosen and transforms victims propelled by their neurobiological environment into free agents 
perpetrators of actions for which they are fully responsible. Just as Saz insists that the psychiatry patients are moral agents, he similarly sees psychiatrists as moral agents. The medical paradigm implicitly argues that psychiatrists are not morally culpable for their consequences of their psychiatric practice. In the rhetorical paradigm, the psychiatrist who deprives people of their autonomy would be seen as consciously imprisoning agent, not merely a doctor providing therapy, language which insistu insistu insulates psychiatrists from the moral responsibility of their act. The rhetorical paradigm, rep and this guy's a lawyer, so the rhetorical paradigm represents a significant thread to institutional psychiatry. For not only is Saz arguing that psychiatry is non scientific, and not only is the language inherent in the rhetorical paradigm foreign and unadaptable to psychiatrists practicing the normal science, so called normal science. But without the medical model for protection, psychiatry becomes little more than a vehicle for social control and the primary violator of individual freedom and autonomy, made acceptable by the medical cloak. The myth of mental illness is written without the polemics of some of Saza's later work, yet the first major book, according to Harvard psychiatrist Alan Stone, earns the lasting enmity of his profession. <laughs> That's in Weinberg's pinpoint the common misreading of my work is especially useful among so this is going to be the main misreading among scholars the opposition to Saz sometimes appears to ignore what he has actually written a frequent repeated criticism of Saz rests on basic misunderstanding of his proposition that the effect that as C.G. Schoenfield argues he quote fails to offer his readers detailed descriptions case histories and like a representative cross-section of persons whom psychiatrists usually judge to be neurotic or psychotic, but whom he has interviewed or examined as a psychiatrist, and whom he has demonstrated to be completely normal. In, what, in one form or another, many critics voice this objection. However, in offering such a criticism, Schoenfield and others who make similar objections demonstrate a lack of understanding of the fundamental assertion of Sass that the very use of language of medicine, quote, neurotic or psychotic versus completely normal, constitutes a type of category error. And it's a necessary category error because that's what the whole thing is based on. Schoenfield's demand makes perfect sense within the existing paradigm. All he's saying is that we should qualify, but no sense whatever from outside the paradigm. One, Schoenfield's demands make perfect sense from within the existing paradigm, but no sense from whatever from outside the paradigm. Critique can only be done from outside of your ideology, from outside of your paradigm. One reviewer concluded, the reviewer knows of no psychiatrist who agrees with him and is sorry to consider his book a total waste of time. In 89, interviewer Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz said that while Sass had had an enormous impact on psychiatry and the law, if you have if you've seen someone somebody who is troubled, you can't believe Sass's arguments that there is no such thing as mental illness. One well regarded text recently attributed to Sass's myth of mental illness is the view that mental illness does not exist, did not exist at all, but was the product of hospitalization. The late Roy Perter, noted English medical historian, began his posthumously published book, Madness, a brief history, as follows. In a brace of books, The Myth of Mental Illness and The Manufacturing of Madness, Thomas Saz denied that there was any such a thing as mental illness. It was not a fact of nature, but a man-made myth. Porter explained, Psychiatry is conventionally defined as a medical speciality concerned with diagnosis and treatment of mental, Ill mental diseases. I submit that this definition, which is still widely accepted, places psychiatry in the company of alchemy and astrology and commits to the category of pseudoscience. Why? The reason is plain. There is no such thing as, quote, mental illness. For Saz, who has continued to uphold these opinions for the last 40 years, mental illness is not a disease whose nature is being elucidated by science. It is rather a myth fabricated by psychiatrists for reasons of professional advancement, careerism, and endorsed by society because it sanctions easy solutions for problem people. Over the centuries, he alleges medical men and other support and their supporters have been involved in self-serving manufacture of madness by affix <laughs> by affixing psychiatric labels to people who are social pests, odd or challenging, 
and in this orgy of stigmatization, organic psychiatrists have been had have been no less to blame than Freud and his followers, whose invention of unconsciousness, says alleges, breathed new life into defunct metaphysics of mind and theologies of the soul. All expected of all expectations of finding the etiology of mental illness in body or mind, not to mention some Freudian underworld, is Sasa's view a category mistake or sheer bad faith. Mental illness and the unconscious are but metaphors and misleading ones of that. In reifying such loose talk, psychiatrists have either naively pictorialized the psyche or have com been complicit in shady professional imperialism, pretending to expertise, pretending to expertise they do not possess. In view of all this, standard psychiatric approaches to insanity and its history are vit vitiated by hosts of illicit assumptions and questions mal posé. One of the most illicit assumptions in, inherent in the standard psychiatric approach to insanity is treating persons called mentally ill as sick patients needing psychiatric treatment, regardless of whether they seek or help seek or reject help. This accounts for an obvious but overlooked difficulty peculiar to psychiatry, namely that the term refers to two radically different kinds of practices: curing healing souls by conversion and by coercing, controlling persons by force, authorized and mandated by the state. Critics of psychiatry journalists and public alike regularly fail to distinguish between counseling voluntary clients and coercing and excusing captives of, psychi of the psychiatric system. In 67, my efforts to undermine the moral legitimacy of the alliance of psychiatry and the state suffered a serious blow. The creation of the anti-psychiatry movement called by David Cooper and Ronald D. Liang. Instead of advocating, oh, interesting. Instead of advocating for the abolition of institutional psychiatry, they sought to replace it with their own brand of psychiatry. They called it anti-psychiatry. By means of this dramatic misnomer, they attracted attention to themselves and deflected attention from what they did, which included coercions and excused people on, based on psychiatric authority and power. Anti-psychiatry is a type of psychiatry. The psychiatrist qua healthcare professional is a fraud, and so too is the anti-psychiatrist. Now, that's so scary, right? It reminds me of, the, oh my goodness, that reminds me of like the PSYOP operation. If you look at what happened to Dr. Shiva and uh, his exposing of the Twitter files, because the Twitter files was going to be released anyway, they did a PSYOP operation to make a, a clean version of this exposition through the work of Matt Taibbi. Look at, because Dr. Shiva was the first to um, bring out the Twitter files, but he wasn't the one that was popularized. Voltaire's famous, and it's the same with, you know, Rumi and Shams and Tabriz. Rumi uh, praises Shams, but at the same time, Shams's work is overshadowed by Rumi's because Shams was the radical, was the actual radical position. They always have these fake radical positions to destroy the radical movements, basically. And this has happened in Occupy over and over and over again. It's like a false flag or something like that. Or uh, look at my video on KFAB, KFAB and uh, Reagan. Voltaire's famous aphorism, God protect me from my friends, I'll take care of my enemies, proved to apply perfectly to what happened next. Although my critique of the alliance of psychiatry and state annotates by two decades the reinvention of popularization of the term anti-psychiatry, I was smeared as anti-psychiatrist and my critics wasted no time identifying and dismissing me as the leading anti-psychiatrist. That is key. That's a key tactic of the CIA. That's a key, 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 it's a key tactic of the CIA. For more than 50 years, I have, in, I have maintained that mental illnesses are counterfeit diseases, non-diseases, that coerced psychiatric relations are like coerced labor relations, slavery or coerced sexual relationships. And I spent the better part of my professional life criticizing the concept of mental illness, objecting to the practices of involuntary institutional psychiatry and advocating the abolition of psychiatric slavery and psychiatric rape. Not surprisingly, the most aggressively, the more aggressively I reminded psychiatrists that individuals incarcerated in mental health hospitals, in mental hospitals are, oh, see, 
Freudian slip, are deprived of liberty, the more zealously they insisted that mental illnesses are like other illnesses, and the, and the psychiatric institutions are bona fide medical hospitals. The psychiatric establishment's defense of coercion and excuses thus reinforced my argument about the metaphorical nature of mental illnesses and importance of the distinction between coerced and consensual psychiatry. Anyone who seeks to help others, whether by means of religion or by means of medicine, must eschew the use of force. I am not aware of any anti-psychiatrist who has agreed with the principle abided by this limitation. Subsuming my work under the rubric of anti-psychiatry betrays and negates its just as effectively as surely as subsuming it under the rubric of psychiatry. My writings form no part of either psychiatry or so-called anti-psychiatry and belong to neither. They belong to conceptual analysis, social political criticism, civil liberties, and common sense. This is why I have rejected and continue to reject psychiatry and anti-psychiatry with equal vigor. It's so, it's so hard to be someone of an intellect like Thomas says. Uh, the psychiatric establishment's rejection of my critique of the concept of mental illness and its defense of coercion as cure and of excuse making as humanist mercy posed no danger to my work. On the contrary, contemporary biological psychiatrists tacitly recognize that mental illnesses are not and cannot be brain diseases. Once a putative disease becomes a proven disease, it ceases to be classified as a mental disorder and is reclassified as a bodily or disorder, bodily disease, or in the persistence absence of such evidence, a mental disorder becomes a non-disease. This is how one type of mental illness, neurosyphilis, became a brain disease, while another type, homosexuality, became reclassified as a non-disease. Formerly, when church and state were allied, people accepted theological justifications for state-sanctioned coercion. Today, when medicine and the state are allied, people accept therapeutic justifications for state-sanctioned coercion. Biopolitics. This is how the same... This is how some 200 years ago psychiatry became, became an arm of the coercive apparatus of the state. And this is why today all of medicine threatens to become transformed from personal therapy to political therapy. Personal therapy into political tyranny. The personal is not political. Science must begin with myths, with criticisms of myths. Karl Popper.